students of the College of New Rochelle in New Rochelle, New York. He was a former assistant professor of psychology in the City University of New York. He is a senior partner of Africana Research Publications and a senior partner of Harlem Graphics Art Center. Dr. Wilson is author of The Developmental Psychology of the Black Child and of the forthcoming book, Black on Black Violence and Enhancing the IQ of the Black Child. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Dr. Amos Wilson's first time here with Omic Society, but we definitely hope it's not his last. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Amos Wilson.
And so we talk about racism too in a way as if it is something that sort of has a life of its own, as if it is not something practiced by people and by a certain people. You understand? Now, when you realize that racism is practiced by certain people who you can see and point your fingers at, you know, and put your hands on, you ultimately realize that you are not only fighting racism, but you are fighting a people. And ultimately, if you want to prevent racism from having the negative effects that it has on our people, it means you're going to have to gain the power to neutralize those people who perpetrated on us, which means ultimately you're going to have to challenge white power. You're going to have to put the white man, the European man, in a position not to practice racism. So otherwise, you're playing games with your mind, and you're playing games with other people. You talk about racism as if there are no people, you know, real people behind it, and if it does not imply that you have to gain real power <coughs> in the world to prevent people from practicing certain sorts of things. We skirt around those issues. We skirt around the issue of money and wealth, and we skirt around the issue of power. And uh, this has caused us tremendous problems, and it will cause us even greater problems in the future. Our refusal to deal with economics in a real sense, to deal with money and wealth in a real sense, means that we are vulnerable to biological annihilation on this earth. Now, I'm not being rhetorical and being very literal. In other words, when we talk about money and wealth, we're talking about life and staying alive. And as I will point out later, we're not merely talking about earning a best salary moving up uh, one notch in the class uh, system. We're staying alive. And our refusal is by people to confront the issue of money and wealth is going to end up with our very lives being threatened as a people on this earth. And therefore, we must have very frank and open discussions about it. I'm going to go through a number of reasons why I think we have problems with the issue of money and wealth. Obviously, I don't have time to cover them in detail. In the future, perhaps with the symposium, we can deal with them in detail. I have about a list of 20, so obviously, I cannot uh, give long explanations of, either, of each one. But we are caught in a paralyzing contradiction regarding money and wealth creation. <laughs> a part of it is the result, I believe, of religious sentiment. You know, the love of money is the root of all evil. You know, we, we've been taught that one very well. So in a sense, I think many of us see the idea of talking about money in a very bold sense, talking directly, and somehow equivalent to engaging in some sinful discussion, almost as bad as talking about sex, I guess. And uh, the idea then that money and the speaking of money represents something evil makes us avoid the issue. I want you to recall at this moment that Africans did not come across this ocean as Christians. And I know that you know hurts some people's feelings, but you must face your historical reality. You were not Christians in Africa. And, uh, you know, I'm not attacking Christianity, I'm dealing with a historical situation. You became Christians in America, to a great extent. That might have been one or two Christians, but in the general, no Christians. And to a good extent, that Christianity came through the auspices of our masters. It's very important that you look at that situation and confront the reality that people give you nothing, people in power hand you nothing that is going to do what? Overthrow their power. 
while you can believe in Christianity and, you, and you're welcome to believe in Christianity and it's authentic and real, you must differentiate between Christianity as a religion and as a faith and the use of Christianity as a tool by another group of people. And this is also the case with Islam and any other religion. You see, and I often have to confront this sometimes because if you're not careful in defending your religious faith and your, your, your religion, you also end up defending the status quo, which was the intention of those who taught the religion to you. So then often in defending Christianity, we end up defending the white man's right to be on top and to rule over us. Just as many Muslims in defending Islam end up justifying the rulership of Africans by Arabs. And there's a difference between Arabism and Islam. And I don't think for a minute Islam justifies the ruling of Africans by Arabs, as I don't think for a minute Christianity <laughs> justifies the ruling of black people by white folk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I want you to be clear. I'm not talking about your religion, but I'm talking about what is use. And that people who teach it to you are not always concerned about your praising the Lord, but are concerned about how that religion is used to manipulate you and to maintain them in power. In fact, I, I, a gentleman spoke with me one evening after I alluded to this issue about uh, uh, a gentleman he worked for, a white gentleman he worked for. He, as I recall, he was a chauffeur for this gentleman. And the white gentleman was a was an atheist. Yet he, I believe, uh, financed religious activities and, and religious proselytization proselytization in in various communities. And uh, he asked him, you know, you being an atheist, how do you justify the supporting of religious uh, activities and conversion of people to uh, to uh, this religion. And the rich gentleman told him, well, I do it because I want to sleep in peace at night. <laughs> you see? And, and of course, you can see the, the situation there. He saw that religion as a means of protecting his own wealth. So if you steal from the people, rape, rob them, enslave them, take their labor free for generation after generation, and then you teach them, thou shalt not steal. <laughs> thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's ox. Isn't that wonderful? You see, because when they believe it and take it into heart, they will not even take back that which belongs to them. They will, in a sense, they will come to feel that they don't even have a right to the wealth that that was, that was theirs before this even happened. And therefore, the people who stole it can sleep well at night. How about, and, and this, to a good degree, is our religion has been sold to black people and, and, and how it is used to maintain us in the position that we're in. So we have to be very careful about the way religion has, has been promulgated among us for a reason to make sure that we uh, do not fall victim to the game. In fact, I find it very interesting that whites can complain about crime in the streets and fear of being mugged and being hurt, even though they are not the primary victims of, of mugging, by the way. You would think in terms of the news media that whites were right. the greatest victims of so-called black crime. Right. That the, the people who get raped most by blacks are black women. Who get mugged most of, uh, by blacks are black people. It is our attack upon ourselves that is, is more the problem. But of course the reverse picture is projected as if whites are being attacked by black people. And they are the major victims of black, uh, so-called black crime. I find it very interesting that you have this group of people, I refer to whites there, who think 
that after enslaving our people, after raping and robbing and lynching and murdering, miseducating, discriminating, scandalizing, and all of the other things that they've done to African people, they think that they have a right to walk down the street in peace. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, just like America, that they uh, can sleep at peace with that stolen and bloody wealth. It's an amazing uh, arrogance on the part of these people. Amazing. And yet I want them again and again, you'll never sleep in peace and you'll never walk the streets in peace. You, and every time you get stabbed in these streets, and every time you get mugged, you're paying for the sins of your fathers. And you will continue to pay for it. I don't care if the nice little innocent white girl or white boy says, I had nothing to do with slavery. <coughs> you're going to pay for it anyway. For the sins of the first generations of this that are unto us. For the boys, and they continue. Do not think that you can accept the wealth of your fathers and not at the same time accept the curse that goes with it. Until you repent and return that money back to the people from whom you stole it, right? you and your children will suffer regardless of their personal innocence or their good. Yet face I will also tell you something too, is black people getting mugged out here as well. It means we have some things too as fathers that we have not rectified as well. If we are being killed by our own children, and there's a reason for that. And one of them is the fact that we have not dealt correctly with our economic situation. And I'll get back to that momentarily. We often have identified uh, and, uh, wealth, uh, poverty, and goodness. You know, poor but honest. And we somehow think uh, being poor is uh, more holy than being rich. <laughs> you know, we got that syndrome too, that somehow, you know, God is just going to take all the poor people on earth and take them up to heaven. But stop and meditate on that for a moment, you know. A lot of these people out here who are mugging and robbing and so forth are not what? They're not rich. And poor people definitely are not sinless definitely are not any more saintly than hardly any other group of people. So the idea that uh, somehow being poor means you're somehow better than another person, I don't think will hold up to, to serious thought and meditation. But I think we've been sort of fed that ideology, you know, that poverty and goodness and poverty and honesty and, you know, the <coughs> of those uh, poor people uh, has been you know, fed into us to a very great extent. Many of us, I think, are afraid to deal with money and to deal with the issue of wealth because we've been treated as commodities. We were sold as slaves. And I think we've associated in the slave experience with, of course, capitalism and with greed for money. Certainly we cannot deny that as a fact, but we cannot permit this trauma to our people to uh, uh, keep us from dealing with the real issue of wealth and the real issue of money and its place in terms of our empowerment and survival as a people. We cannot let this idea of the fact that we were treated as objects and sold as objects uh, get in our way of, of uh, dealing with the issue of the use of money to our own advantage. We also have come to see money as a national, as a natural white right in the sense that we almost see uh, the idea of white folk having money as a, as a natural thing <laughs> and white folk being rich is you know just that's where it's supposed to be and it's, it's, it's very ironic that we see it that way and it creates a problem because we often do the our first our first thing when it relates to us we almost begin to see black people and wealthy black people as uh, being unnatural. 
as not deserving the wealth that they have created. You see? And we see white as innocent being deserving. And we often see ourselves, we, we almost have a sense that we don't deserve money. We don't deserve wealth. Just like many of us have this feeling we don't deserve power. That's a white folks thing. Mm -hmm. You know, money is a Jewish thing, you know. It's everybody's thing but black folks thing. This is a very, very dangerous concept. Because it often means we will admire a Donald Trump or we will admire rich white folk, but we will envy wealthy black people. It's a whole different attitude. Envy is a very bitter kind of attitude. Ultimately, it is a wish that the person falls from their state and a hope that they do not continue to succeed, that they actually go into ruin. Very, a very different kind of attitude. It means that often, instead of admiring, as we do with Donald Trump, a wish to be like Donald Trump, uh, when we look at our own, we, we, we have a sense almost to wish that that person loses what they have because somehow they don't deserve it. And on top of that, often, we make sure that we don't contribute anything to their wealth. I'm not going to help them get no Cadillac. <laughs> You know, that kind of thing. You ain't going to get rich off my money. We don't mind, you know, all the other people get rich off our money. But for a black person to get rich off our money, that is the ultimate insult. You see, this is the ultimate insult. And often our businesses are defeated, and our attempts and businesses are supposed to be defeated by this kind of attitude. We don't want to see the other ones, any of each of us, the other ones move up in a different sort of position. And we'll overcome with envy and jealousy. And therefore, we will destroy or not support many of our businesses. Even though white wealth is stolen wealth, white wealth is based on the use of the free labor of our parents, great grandparents, and the parents before them that's completely stolen. Captive wealth, brutalized wealth enslaved wealth. And somehow we still think they are deserving of the money. Amazing attitude. This wealth is based on the colonialization of African countries. The Industrial Revolution of Europe, based upon the molasses of Jamaica, based upon the sugar crops of the Caribbean. The wealth of the white South Africans and Europeans today, based upon the gold and diamonds and oil and minerals and everything else taken right out of the African continent, taken right out of the soils of our people in the Caribbean, Central and South America, and yet we have nerve enough to think that these people are deserving of that wealth, and we have nerve enough to think that we are undeserving and that it should not belong to us. What an insult to our own intelligence. But I have often stated that in order for us to be in the condition we are in as people, we literally have to be turned backwards. We have to think the very opposite of what would make us great as people and move us forward as people. The white man who is less than 10% of the world's population can only rule the world and the other 9% through deception and lies. As I've indicated before, we can only be in the condition that we are in as one of the largest majorities on this earth if we are out of our minds. In other words, to be in the position that we are in as black people, we literally have to be crazy. And this is one of the major departures between an African psychology today and European psychology. You must recognize that being out of our minds is a political, economic necessity for your business. How else do you explain then a group of people who live on a relatively small uh, land mass, whose lands do not contain the bulk of the wealth of this world, 
And yet those people are perceived as rich and powerful and overfed. And the people who live over the world's wealth are seen as poor, poverty stricken, and starving. A reversal. A complete reversal. I talk about often what I call the theory of race, racial complementarity. In the sense that if one race is to be efficiently exploited by another race, then the subordinate race must have a personality and behavioral orientation that complements the dominant race. In a sense, they have to fit like hands and gloves. So then, if whites are active, blacks must be passive. You see, if whites are abstract thinkers and conceptual thinkers, then black must be concrete, functional thinkers. You see, if whites are analytical in their thought and so forth, we must be global and diffuse in our thinking style. If whites have a high sense of racial and ethnic identity, we must be the ultimate individualist in the world. And you can go down this list and you will see then that the black personality is twisted in a mirror image of the white personality to maintain that system, which is one of the reasons on another occasion I'll explain to you why black children have so many problems in these schools. Why there has been a black style developed and conditioned in this country and how they're set up for failure. In the very areas that would threaten white power in terms of our ways of thinking, you will find our children having problems. Let me put it this way. I often say this. If you want to know the characteristics of black people and black children in a general sense, you only basically need to answer the question, what must be missing or present in the black personality that it maintains European power? Think about that for a minute. In other words, in order for the European to stay in power, we have to have inbuilt in us certain characteristics, mental, psychological, social characteristics. And you stop and think then, what characteristics should we have in us that will keep them in power as people? Because remember, this is a minority. This is not a majority people, this is a minority people. And yet, they, are, they have power over us. That means that, that as I said earlier, our minds and our behavior and our orientation toward the world has to be set up in such a way that we, in a sense, maintain these people in their position of power. When you meditate on that question, you will see then those very characteristics that maintain Europeans in power will either be missing in our children or present depending on their nature. And they make it more concrete. If Thinking abstractly and conceptually among black people means that we, we would be able to look through the nonsense of these ads on TV. We mean that we would not fall, uh, become victimized by these emotional appeals so that we would want to kill each other over a pair of sneakers or sell poison to our children to buy BMW. And this kind of, uh, of junk and God, You know, if you can follow a mugger after they mug you, chances are they're not going to pay rent with that money. Think about junk and God. That some TV show or somebody has shown them makes them something. That means you have to have a certain mentality for that. But the person who's able to sit there and look through that ad to laugh at it and recognize the silliness of it, 
to recognize the game that's behind it, to resist it very well, that person is a threat to European dominance. The Europeans would fall if we didn't follow those deals. <coughs> Therefore, what are you going to find most problematic in many of our children in schools? Conceptual thinking, abstract thinking, analytical thinking. If thinking technologically as a people and acting technologically means that we could ultimately challenge the IBMs, the AT&Ts, and other things of this world, then you are going to find that your children will have the greatest problems where? In mathematics, science, and technological thinking. Am I getting across that? Here's what I'm saying. If loving one another, if identifying yourself as African, and relating to each other as African, and thinking in terms of each other as African, and behaving individually in terms of your African descent and relationship to other people means the overthrow of Europeans, you are going to have trouble in self-love and relating one with one another and loving one another. If being able to trust each other if being able to be reliable in your relationship with each other and keeping your word with each other and supporting each other means that you can then form a collective force, being a majority, against European power, one of the greatest problems you're going to have with each other is what? Trust. We must be what? Suspicious of each other. We must be what? unreliable in our relationship one with the other. You see what I'm saying? In other words, the characteristics that are necessary to maintain the European system are bred into the African personality. That's why when I talk about the education of black children, you recognize that the education of black children resembles nothing like the education of white children. The whole curricular approach and the pedagogical approach would have to be different. Because we must put back into our children and into ourselves what has been taken out and what has been repressed if we are to liberate ourselves. But as I'm going to talk in a minute, many of us have bought this stupid idea called standard education and equal education. And it is the buying of those ideas standard education, equal education, that we've been destroyed and will be destroyed as people. There's no such thing as equal education. No such thing as a standard education. I talk to you, there's no such thing as standard business. But we bought the concept. In fact, we'll engage in a discussion on education without even defining what we're talking about. We'll just assume education is what we've always been doing and what white folks have been doing all along. It doesn't occur to us that we need to redefine our whole concept. We need to ask ourselves, why? For what purpose are our children reading? Why are they learning that? You have a problem sometimes when your children come back and say, Daddy, why do I have to study this? It's hard to come, down, come up with a reason other than what? Working for the slave master. <laughs> yeah, think beyond that. Think how often you said it so you can get a job. You know? And move so farther beyond that. You know? And that creates problems. White Wealth Stoneman, we have been consigned the role of consumers in this system. We think of ourselves as consumers. Our purpose in this world, as far as the world system is concerned, is to buy. Not to produce, but to consume. We measure ourselves against white in terms of the amount of consumption that we engage in, not in terms of production. We think that a man who drives a Cadillac is equal to the man that makes it. <laughs> yeah, and we confuse the two things. So we think we drive a Cadillac like white folk, we live in houses like white folk, 
We eat like white folk, we talk like white folk, you know, we are like white folk. That's a lie. It's a cruel deception. You will never make it up in the world and gain any respect among people and have any power through consumption. You only, only gain respect and you only gain power through production not through buying, ladies and gentlemen. No African nation or any group of people can buy themselves into respect and buy themselves into power. And you have leaders who misled you in many ways by comparing your income against white income. You say, a terrible because income and wealth are not the same thing. You may have an income of $100,000 a year because you're getting a check of so much per month. That's quite different from a man who has an income based on the fact that he owns $10 million worth of property. You see? So when people are running the income game on your because, you know, when you blow that check, when you, when you get fired next month, you're done. <laughs> that $100,000 of wealth is nothing. It is, in fact, it is not even wealth. It ends right at that point. You see? But a man with $10 million worth of property has got a lot more resources and possibilities, you see. But we have, our leaders have compared income instead of wealth. And this has created tremendous problems with us. As a matter of fact, it is time for us now to question black leadership. Period. You look at the condition that black people are in today, and crack, and unemployment, and homelessness, and all the other kind of things, and you basically have the same black leadership you've had for the past 30 years. It is about time for you to begin to question the validity of that leadership. If these people were running for president and so forth, you would have thrown them out of office a long time ago. Because you would say, hey, look at when you came in, and look at where we are now. How can you validate your leadership looking at the concrete condition of our people? We don't call our leaders in the past. You've been led by the NAACP, the Urban League, and various other so-called black organizations which are really not black and never have been from their inception, and have led to the situation where we are today, where economically we are suffering to a very great extent. We've had leaders who protested against our not being hired in places where we spend our money. But we haven't had leaders who have talked about what? Owning those places. <laughs> I have a uh, business here at 125th Street, and while I like to appreciate Adam Clayton Power's struggles against discrimination in hiring, and that was a magnificent struggle he years ago, and finally getting blacks hired in those places. Yet I look at that same street today, and you can count on the fingers of one hand how many black people actually own anything on that street. Even though 95% of the customers on the street are black people. And yet you have a Charles Rangel and a bunch of others there who seem to have a little or no concern about that situation and deal with that situation. And we send them to Congress year after year after year after year. We have to check this kind of thing out. We have been run in by what we call non-economic liberalism. The NAACP with no economic program, the Urban League with no economic program. I have a book here, a beautiful book. They put out beautiful books every year. The State of Black America, 1988. They'll have the State of Black America in 1989. The state of, you know, every year, State of Black America. Wonderful statistics. But no theory, no program. You see? No program at all there. And yet we, we permitted ourselves to let these people set policy for us. And we are reaping the results of it. They overran Washington, Booker T. Washington's program. They overran Marcus Garvey and others, and now we can see the result of it. We, in fact, believe in 
group in individual wealth as against group wealth. We are, in a sense, the only true Americans in America, black people. We really believe in that stuff. <laughs> we really believe uh, in individualism. And yet we are the most stereotyped people in the country. We are viewed as stereotypes by other people. We are rarely seen as individuals by other people. And yet we are the most firm believers in individualism. It's a pity. Do your own thing. You do yours and I do mine. Because the reality is all other ethnic groups act in terms of their ethnicity. And the reality is America is a pluralistic society, not a society of individuals. The reality is that there is no individual power without group power. You cannot become an individual ultimately until your group becomes collectively strong. The reason why we see white people as individuals is because of white power. If they had no power and they were powerless, we could see them as a bunch of powerless poor people. You have some people who play uh, tricks on their mind that say, I don't see color. <laughs> and then you're not seeing color matters. Because you don't see color means that nobody else has said anything about Because nobody else don't see you as much color. <laughs> So we think if we deny our color and deny ourselves as people of color, that somehow that miraculously means that the other people don't see us as the best in color. Still do this. Terrible. And you'll see it almost all the time when a Negro is getting ready to give his money away to white folks or to justify not supporting African people. You'll almost hear that statement in America. I don't see color. And I recognize that that's exactly the state of mind you have to be in so that other people can pick your pockets. You see, not seeing color. You can ultimately only gain individual strength through group strength. I talk to college students sometimes by saying, you know, many of you think that you're here at this college, particularly those in predominantly white colleges and so forth, because you come from, you know, some big family, because you scored high on the SATs, because you studied hard and you stayed away from the parties and you did all of this stuff right here at the great university you are here today. Lies. You think you're the first person that came from good families? You think you're the first generation that had good families? Black people have had good families from the beginning. You think you're the first generation to study hard? You think you're the first generation of blacks who can score high on SAT exams? Yet I grew up in a generation of people where it didn't matter how high you could score on the exam, how much you studied, you, there were just certain colleges you were not going to, period. Period. That was it. In fact, you don't even bother. They didn't even give you the exam to take. Don't bother to apply. How did we get into those schools? Not because of the scores we made and so forth, but because blacks without degrees, the blacks who never see the inside of a college and others, put their bodies on the line because of black power, because of the collective activity of black people. That collective activity then permits you as an individual now to have a choice of colleges. It permits you to choose your profession. It permits you to say, well, I'll be a computer engineer, I'll be this, I'll be that. But remember, that choice is based on what? Group power and the willingness of the black group to back that right up. It is not a right that is inherited you as an individual, and it is not a right that was just given to you simply because you were born or simply because you went to the right school. All right. And when those people in those universities and other places decide they want to take it back from you, it will have to be that black community again that will stand up and say no. And we forget that often. You know, we got a lot of people now that got a little position in the world and they want to make it, uh, 
You know, they want to say it's all the result of their own individual assets. <laughs> you see, no, it is group power that makes individual joys possible. Which means then that we try to increase our wealth and power as black people, we then must increase it in terms of increasing the power and wealth of the whole group. Or else, individual power and wealth is a mere illusion. I look at uh, Johnson, Johnson Publications, for instance, and I look at the difference between that magazine in the 60s and what it is today, and how in many ways it cannot deal with real issues in terms of black folk. And even though he may have millions of dollars, in a way there's a fundamental weakness there. Why? Because he cannot afford to do what? Insult is what? White advertising. So his wealth is really not what? Power, as it would be among the others. His wealth, but in a way, his wealth is also his what? His weakness. I, being poor and without anything, can say what I want. <laughs> if he had, though, a black nation doing business and creating wealth, he too could say what he wanted to say. Because he'd have that wealth and nation of people supporting what he had to say. But because he must depend upon another people, he cannot afford to insult them. And yet, when you deal with the real issues of black people, you must insult white folk. And so the idea is that you can have individual wealth, un un uh, not tied up to the wealth of black people as a group, is an illusion of wealth and an illusion of power. And yet many of us have bought into this kind of situation. So we got a lot of us trying to run this little individual game without understanding that it has to be all or none. We've got caught in our educational problems because we believe the white man is invincible, that he cannot be defeated. Miserable belief. All people and throughout history, all civilizations rise and fall. Many people ask me, why did we fall as black people? On a metaphysical level, if you're the first to rise, you'll be what? Basically the first to fall. That's the way life civilizations go through what? Cycles. There has not been one yet that way has lasted for what? Forever. You met Romans, Greeks, you know, Africans, this one and that one. And ladies and gentlemen, the white man is going to go one day too. I know it's not right. hard to believe. And I'm sure you could have convinced the Roman that one day the Roman Empire would be gone, or the Athenians that one day Athens would be gone, you know, but they're gone. And yet somehow in our society, it's like people, we just kind of see these people as what? Lasting forever. And the invisible and cannot be overthrown. The Japanese didn't think so. When you get that mentality then, you give up. We've been sold the idea of education as a solution to our bad problems. Education is very important. And of course, I know many of you are raised. You can't get an education. Fine. Nothing wrong with it. Except that it is only a part of the solution, it is not the total solution. We, I insist, sort of believe ourselves to be in eternal servitude. When I mentioned here earlier, uh, 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 earlier that when our children ask us why they, why should they be studying math, or why they study this and that, about the the only excuse we can give them for this so that they can get a job for other people, that the assumption that somehow white people will always own everything and control everything, and therefore the best we can do is to qualify to work for them. But isn't there a higher motivation? Isn't there a higher cost when you say you're studying that so that you can overthrow white economic power? So that you can outthink those people? That you are at war with these people economically, socially, and militarily, and the reason why you are studying is so that we can win this struggle, 
for our lives and survival as a people. If you really saw education not as a job market, not as a way of merely moving up on the social ladder, but as necessary to your very survival, then you wouldn't have as much problem as you have getting down to these schools, seeing that those children learn what they should learn. Right on. You see? But you have not yet come to the realization that education is about survival, not about jobs. I was talking to a friend of mine just before I left this afternoon, and he was talking about what uh, a book he was reading called The Genetic Wars. How the Europeans have taken an African fever, dengue fever, and through gene splicing increased its potential, its, its dangerous potential, and how it could be sprayed on populations and so forth and used on populations. I had read an article in the Wall Street Journal, oh, now maybe two, three years ago, a long piece, that talked about the U.S. germ warfare research, where 23 American universities were engaged in that research. Also, the New York Depart uh, the Board of Health. Also, the Department of Agriculture. Also, MDs. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, the university system of the United States is as much a part of the United States military establishment right. as is any other institution. Jobs are secondary to their functions. You see, when these uh, planes drop bombs on your head, when these laser beam weapons fire from 500 miles out in space, when these germs, such as AIDS and other germs, be released, uh, will be released on us and have been released on us, you must recognize that those things have not been created by people in the streets. <coughs> those things have been created by professors, by PhDs, and in the university laboratories of this country. That's why educated people are the most dangerous people in the world. It is not the crack dealers that will destroy this earth, ladies and gentlemen. It is not the muggers that will destroy this earth, ladies and gentlemen. It will be people with PhD degrees with two fair haired children and a two car garage. <laughs> Upstanding, moral, church going citizens who, after they leave service and rest Sunday night, go Monday morning to make bombs and weapons to destroy themselves, their children, and the whole of mankind on earth. And it's those professors who don't even teach very often, who are doing research for the government and doing research for the army and so forth, to such a degree now, to degree now that the United States scientific establishment has been skewed in its, in its uh, orientation toward research by military research, which is one of the reasons why it cannot appropriately compete with Japan, because its best brains have been used in the creation of death machines as against machines that can be used right. for commerce. Right. Understand it. That is why, you see, it is not enough for you to go to white schools and get degrees from white schools. You must own those schools and control those schools. I'll be back to that in a minute. One of the reasons why we have problems, too, economically, is the people we see, we see racism as a psychomoral problem. Racism essentially is an economic problem. It is essentially a, a rationalization for maintaining economic, political, military, and other kind of controls over another people. It is not an attitude problem. We think that really we change white folks' attitude. If they realize we bleed like they do, and we do this like they do, they're going to come to love us. You are out of your mind. <laughs> Do you think merely by uh, having these people believe their creed that you're going to get out of the situation you're in? You think, no. This racism is a justification and a rationalization for maintaining economic, political, and social dominance. Even the apparent change of racism by whites 
is still going to be used to maintain their racial dominance. That is, when whites become less obviously racist in their overt attitude, their wealth and their power will still remain where it is. As a matter of fact, they have learned that one of the best ways now of maintaining their power is to appear to be less overtly racist. It's a, now, you think getting black mayors and governors elected represents some advancement for black people? And I realize, of course, we've been through this game before. This is the second reconstruction anyway. You know, we, we, we're getting duped again. And you think that the moving of black people in, in the classes, in, in wealth and so forth, represents some advance for black people? I call it neoclassism to uh, sort of as a parallel with what? Neo-colonialism, where a minority which seeks to maintain its power, where it does not have numerical advantage, recruits from the very people it oppresses so that those recruits can be used to maintain the power and position of the original group. So the European recognizes that he can more, uh, as efficiently or more efficiently dominate African economic affairs by having Africans as head of government than having himself as the chief governor of African countries. And now we're going to get a black middle class that puts a black face on white power. Let us not be deceived. So we think then that the problem that we are facing with whites and racism is a problem of morality. And this is in part the result of being led by preachers. You see, and not having a strong secular leadership in the black community. Because people tend to see problems in terms of their profession. And ministers being concerned very much about moral issues tend to moralize most issues. You see, but there's much more going on in this world than just a bad attitude. The other, the other problems that we've looked at, the other reason why we have problems economically is we see our economic problems are resulting from civil rights. And let me just be rapid in terms of the time. Civil rights. It's like a prisoner saying, I have rights in prison. <laughs> you know? Civil rights are not the same as what? Liberation and so forth. They're not the same as independence and control of oneself. But the thing that I want to get across here is we have this faith in laws. We think as long as the Supreme Court is up there, the government is up there, we have civil rights uh, laws on the books. Everything is going to be cool for us. Let me just quickly tell you one thing, ladies and gentlemen. If we get down to the point of where the white man has to make a choice, between feeding his children or yours. No amount of laws on books, no amount of Supreme Courts, no amount of black governors and mayors or anything else is going to have him feed your children before he feeds his own. The laws are only as strong as their enforcers. And the people who pass the laws are also the same people who enforce the laws. And when it comes to the point where they have to make a choice in terms of their survival, and power as against your own, they will ignore the law or seek to uh, or not enforce the law. So ultimately, your salvation lies in power, not in goodwill of the other people, not in the love of the other people, not in laws on the books and all of that. It ultimately must rest on pure power and the ability to stop other people from doing harmful things to you. Anything else is not accurate. And yet we've had a bunch of leaders who think that laws on books are adequate to protecting the future of our children and of our people. You must realize that that's a very flimsy basis. We believe in standard business practice. No such thing as standard business practice. You know, we have this idea that there are practices that are, don't have no regard to race or color. Wrong. I had to deal with the person the other day. Oh, this is standard business practice. No, these, these are white folks' business practices that have developed within a white European context. 
built around a white reality, a white economic system, white goals and values and so forth. This is not standard business practice. This is a practice among these people, you see. But when we buy that, that standard, then we all, if we inevitably are defeated in our economic efforts. And this standard business is, is the, and this is the idea of standard is the problem, as I pointed out earlier, even in education. Standard education. There's no such thing as standard education. There's only education that gets you where you need to go to be. I've stated again and again that the educational destiny of the black child is revolutionary, that the educational destiny of the white child is what? Conservative. The major focus of white education is to maintain the advantage that they already have. Black people not having advantages do not need to get the same education because you're not being educated for the same reason. You're being educated to remove that advantage. You're being educated to feed your starving children. You're being educated to benefit from the wealth that is being stolen from the lands of your ancestors. You're being educated to benefit from the wealth that you create here as a people. That means that our children must be reared to undertake their destiny and to undertake the tasks that lie before them. The problems that black children have to solve are not those that white children have to solve. Education is defined in terms of the problems people must solve. When you go to white schools, you are learning to solve white folks' problems. That's why you can work better for them and solve their problems better than you can your own. That's why, despite the fact that you may have an MBA degree or business administration degree, you own virtually no businesses and you administer nothing belonging to yourself, and you have no control over anything economically. In fact, the more degrees you've gotten, the more other people have taken your businesses from you and your neighborhoods. Which means you're being educated for servitude. So the, high, those, the highest educated black is in the same position as the lowest one, and that is they're being educated or not educated in service to white power. Intelligence, we are not even intelligent. Black people are made stupid by the education that they get. And the more education we get, the more stupid we become. Yes, I know this is harsh words, but we have to deal with the reality. We are literally educated into dumbness. We call being intelligent high scores on the SAT, high, uh, high grades at Harvard and Yale how much we uh, created for IBM, and how much we created for AT&T. Ladies and gentlemen, that had nothing to do with intelligence at all. You let other people define intelligence for you in such a way that it also means maintaining them in power. The ultimate value of intelligence, the ultimate point of intelligence, is to solve one's own problems and to secure one's own survival. God put intelligence in you so that you could adapt to the environment you live in or adapt the environment to you to further your own life and your own being. I don't care how much you know, how much you've learned, how deeply you've been educated by other people. If you cannot solve your own economic problems, if you cannot solve your own military problems, if you cannot secure your own survival, which should be the point of education, then you have been made dumb and stupid and ignorant by that education. That's why you have to get rid of the concept of equal education and the equating of same and equalness. You do not need the same education as white people. You do not have the same problems as white people. Therefore, you require a knowledge that is relevant to the problems that you have as a people. And when you solve the, those problems, that confront you as a people, and you collect the information relevant to solving those problems, and you develop the mental skills and abilities and capacity to solve those problems, then you are intelligent. It has nothing to do with your record at Harvard or Yale or any of the rest of these institutions. Do you understand what I'm trying to get across? Yeah. 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 That's why you must, number one, redefine every word you've been taught in America. You are defeated 
by the very fact that you don't look at the words you use. The very fact that you go into a discussion, male-female relations, the education of black children, fight crime, this, that, without even saying, well, listen, how are we going to define crime? How are we going to define education? How are we going to define the purpose of the black family? Do you know that we have the right to determine any uh, social arrangement called family that we want to? There's no such thing as any sacred family. White folks don't represent what a real family should be. Do you know that the family is reflective of the social political conditions under which a people survive? That we as black people have a right to say, wait a minute, looking at our current reality, looking at the future problems we want to solve, we believe that the best way to arrange a family and for black men and black women to relate is this way, and it has nothing to do with the way white is doing it. But we've never even thought about the fact that we have that what? That right. You see? We've never realized that we can define family in the way we want. Feel like it. That's because we don't have a sense of people. And we don't have a sense of nation. When you think of yourself as a people, and when you think of yourself as a nation, then you know that a people and a nation have a right to make their own laws and rules. It's only when you lose that that you think you have to go and get authority to redefine yourself and develop yourself from another people. And therefore you're destroyed by accepting the definitions of other people and trying to impose those definitions on your situation, even though you live in vastly different situations. What do I say? You can't be like white folk, just like white folk. Why? Unless you are one white folk. Because people live not in terms of just their skin, they live in particular social, political, economic, historical situations. And their personalities, their minds, and so their relationships and so forth are intricately related to the situations and circumstances under which they live. People then who do not live within the reality of their situation and live within their own sense of, of destiny and values and so forth are people who live outside of themselves and literally people who live out of their minds. And so you have a group of people who are trying to act like another group of people who are in a completely different set of circumstances and situations. You're going to have people who are misfunctional. Let me rush through our time is moving. Take your time, bro. Take your time. And we gotta come back again. Take your time. We have a confusion of money with income. We 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 haven't even defined what an economy is. A lot of us confuse money and economy. Having money is not having an economy. Economy has existed prior to money. An economy ultimately is a set of social relations between people, ladies and gentlemen, not money, social relations. A systematic set of relationships between people. A crowd at a football stadium is not an economic system. This is a bunch of people with money in their pockets. Okay? The people who get their money are the people who have the what? The system. The hot dog business and the other people, they got a system. And they suck then the money out of those people's pockets. Wouldn't it be interesting if those people bought their own hot dogs and the whole thing? <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> then they got what? If the fans themselves had what? Uh, an economic system? They would have cheaper hot dogs, cheaper beer, you know? They would have so many advantages if they thought of themselves and say, hey man, we're going to relate not just to the crowd of people all around Rob. We're going to relate as an economic system. You see a whole different ball game going on. Now they got all of that money and they're sitting there in one place, but they're not an economy. This is a similar situation that we're in as people. We are the ninth or tenth richest nation on this earth in terms of our income. We spend more money here than Canada and, and many other nations. We, in, in fact, have a, a very high level, relatively speaking, of human resources are people who have administrative skills and other kind of skills that other nations in this world would envy. But we are not a nation. We are a bunch of people who have a lot of knowledge, but we exist as well. Individuals. Skills exist as well. Individuals. 
people with money existing as individuals, but people with systems come in and bow to our money is right out of our pocket. Mm -hmm. If though we related to each other in very definite social ways, then we could use our own money, you see, and then we could increase our wealth and develop our wealth. That is why, as I reported earlier, you see, the lack of trust, the lack of reliability, the lack of not getting a kick when you buy something from black people instead of white folk. All of that has been implanted for economic reasons. Every maladjusted characteristic that you find in the black personality is in, it serves an economic function for Europeans. And you just stop to think about it from it. Your lack of self-confidence means that you don't want to take any risk in going into business. So therefore you will not risk represent any challenge to any other people. The other people with self-confidence come and go into business in your community. The people who want to take risks come and go into business in your community. The people who relate to each other socially such that they can pool their money together go into business in your community. People who are reliable in their relationship one to the other go into business in your community. People, uh, I mentioned the other day on the radio show that blacks, uh, 12 or 13 percent of this population, they buy 34 percent of the cosmetics because, of good, because one of the reasons is we are unhappy about our African features and we seek to alter those features. <laughs> and therefore we support a whole cosmetic industry because of the attitude we have toward our own looks as people. Do you think that these people will ever get you to be happy with your looks? As a matter of fact, I think it was Chanel or somebody uh, told somebody, look, we, we, there's no such thing as natural beauty. You know what she said? Natural beauty is our enemy. She was in the cosmetic center. So we never want to tell people there's something called what? Natural beauty, are you kidding? We must tell them that beauty can only be taken from a child. Or else we're out of it. So consequently, then, you must make people all have a certain feeling of unbeauty when they are not, what, cosmetized in some sort of way. <laughs> and it is out of this feeling of inadequacy that wealth is created. And therefore, those people who create the wealth must maintain those people in this feeling of inadequacy. Therefore, feeling inadequate about yourself is a large source of money for whites. And therefore, they will never let you out. I don't care how many songs you sing, and how much you say black is beautiful, until you know it and act it within yourself, yeah, it's going to be your life. <laughs> and you can go from characteristic to characteristic, we don't have time to do it tonight. But you have to realize these characteristics have been put into us for very definite economic reasons. You have to think you can fly like those ads do with those sneakers on. <laughs> Foolish. Chinese working 16 hours a day, what, three dollars a week, two uh, weeks off for the year or something like that. Sneakers cost maybe $10 or $15 to make them to you for $175. And you're so foolish you'll go out and kill somebody to snatch them up with other people's feet. It's an amazing situation. You have to be out of your mind to go for that. We, don't, we have a lack of understanding of the relationship between wealth and power and government. Government is about money. It's about wealth. Black people think it's about models. We want our children to have models. No, you want those politicians to shoot that money in your direction. It's not just, what good is think is being elected to an unemployed man? <laughs> is he supposed to feel less hungry because Lincoln was elected? <laughs> or Wilder was elected down there in, in Virginia? That didn't change my employment situation one whit. And it didn't change the employment situation, but maybe of a handful of blacks who may get a few jobs as tokens. But what does it really mean in the deepest sense of the word? So what do we get? We elect people so that they can, we can get what we call vicarious pleasure out of their being elected. No, other people elect people so they can raid the treasury, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> That's what the deal is about. We elect people because they say, we're going to get you more housing, we're going to get you more welfare, we're going to get... 
No, get the money, bring the money. Yeah. How about that? <laughs> the, New, the New York Board of Education spends about over $6 billion. That's just one unit of New York City. The New York Board of Education is still basically controlled by Jews and white folks, even though 80% of the students are blacks and Hispanics. Why are they continuing to hold on to this board and hold on to this system, even though their children are not in it? Because it's what? Money. Money. That money makes millionaires of people. Do you understand? They make, they, they feed their teachers, who are the majority of the system. They, they feed the construction industry. They feed the vendors of all types and kinds. In other words, they can pass on those billions of dollars to their merchants. And they don't have to have a half brain in their head to make it. You see, they tell you you have to be rich to be smart, don't you? <laughs> Nothing like that. You have to have connections to be smart. Right. You have to have connections to be what? Rich. That's all. One man sitting, your group is sitting on the board, and your group then passes you to what? The money. And you create millionaires because you can do it the money. That's why they stay on the board. Think about the wealth that I could have if I really sold the New York Board of Education chalk, <laughs> pencils. I could be a retard and get wealth behind that. <laughs> All you have to do is order the pencil or the chalk for what? The manufacturer as a middleman and what? Take it over to the Board of Education and then we have your check back and you got money. You see? But we are not taught to think in terms of government and office and so forth as money and wealth creation and the redistribution of wealth. We are made to think of the election of people as symbols and models and do not demand a redistribution of the wealth once they get into office. Why do you think these people spend millions of dollars to get their man into office or in an office that may pay twenty five or thirty thousand dollars? Understand? You wouldn't have to have politicians running to get you more welfare if in their running in their election to office they shift those millions and billions of dollars into your community of the people. No more welfare for you. You got the money coming directly. It's your money anyway. You pay taxes, don't you? But again, miseducation and not understanding the relationship between government and money, politics and money, has destroyed us as a people. We do not understand, of course, the economic, historic repression we've had. I mentioned here, we don't have a sense of territoriality. We just let anybody come in, take out any amount of money they want to, do whatever they want to, and leave. We're the only group of people that will, will let uh, this happen. Limited vision. Some people say, well, you know, you can't get into black capitalism, this and that. That's because we don't think, you must recognize that we as African people are all over this globe. And we are a large people. When you think of African economics, you must not only think of economics within the United States, you must think of African economics as a global system and developing a global African economic system. Now, when you think of African, uh, an African economic system, you're not just talking about 30 million or 40 million African people in America. You're talking now, what, three, four hundred, five hundred millions of people. You're talking about countries where your movies can be sold, countries where your services can be sold. You're talking about millions and millions of people who can be engaged in this. But it's because, again, we have been permitted our vision to be narrow, that we have not seen the tremendous possibilities that we, that we have. Oh, we don't have time. It's just too bad. There's too much to talk about. I want to talk, I wanted to mention, and I'll just do the outline here. And I just want to mention here, by the way, you know, we can talk about our uh, people buying sneakers and BMWs. I want to indicate, of course, that the black middle class is, is no better than the drug dealers on the certain level either. Both the consuming symbols, objects. Both are not investing in the real money anywhere. The black middle class is is is, uh, is very poor in terms of wealth. 
very little money in real productive uh, uh, investments, little money in stocks, little money in bonds, relatively little in real estate, business, I mean almost, it doesn't even count. The 256 business on the, uh, what is it, the, the 500 list, the number 256 business on that uh, business list, the white business list, earns as, as much as, what was it? How many of it, if, you, if I can recall now? A hundred black businesses on the uh, Black Enterprise Magazine list. Do you say what I'm saying? And you have nerve enough as black middle class saying you're only different from white folk in the color of your skin. You're very different from white folk. You're not even beginning to approach white folk. In fact, you say you go to school to learn the same thing white folk learn. Frankly, you could learn the same thing white folk learn by going to school with white folk. Because one of the first things you would learn was that white folk own their own university. <laughs> There's no animal like this black middle class animal. <laughs> Saying he acts like white folks. He thinks because he dressed like white folks, he's like white folks, he acts like white folks. Because he talks like white folks, and he has the same degree from the same school, he's like white folks. You've got to be kidding yourself. If you act like white you know who acts most like white folks if you want to play that game? Farrakhan. That's why he fights him to death. Because he talks the same talk they talk. I don't want to sleep with you, I don't want to live with you. I want to have my own territory control, my own wealth. I want to own my own businesses. I want to own my own houses. I want to deal with you in terms of power, not nagging. And it frightens us to death. But the Negro is supposed to act like white folks. Let me live with you. Love me. Look beyond my color. Accept me. You know. No. Let me send my children to you, even though you say you hate their guts. White folks don't act like that. You know, don't, don't flatter yourself. We are separated from our African history. That's one of the reasons why we're in the trouble. We're in this people. You think history is merely a remembering of famous events. You think history is there merely to stroke your ego, to make you feel good about yourself. I have criticized very straightforwardly black folks approaching history as hero worship and see and searching out Great people. That is a part of it, ladies and gentlemen. But history is much broader than the worship of heroes. History is real and concrete in its effect. History has a thousand answers to a thousand questions. You must not only ask history about what great heroes you've had. You must ask history about how do I solve this problem? How do I deal with this issue in my life? What methods and techniques have we used to cope with this uh, issue, this, this situation. When you study, for instance, the history of the African family, you'll recognize that there was no such thing as the African family. There were a variety of African families, and African families evolved. And therefore, when you look at the problems facing the black family, you don't have to look at white folks. You look in your own history and, then, and see under what circumstances did black folks did Africans take this family style, take this approach or that approach, and how was this how did this approach solve particular problems or issues you see? Why is it that we buy the idea that the father is the only one who can raise a boy into manhood? We bought that from Europeans. Now what a trap we're in when you buy the idea that the father, the biological father, is the only one who can raise a boy appropriately to manhood. Then you have a system that splits the biological father off from the family. Now you're faced with a problem, aren't you? But then if you look back into your own anthropological history, you will see one of the ways we raised boys to manhood was not through the efforts of the single biological father, right? But the rearing of the boy into manhood was the responsibility of all male adults. Therefore, our families do not necessarily have to be crippled by an absent father 
if we look appropriately at our, our own history as people. But we don't look at the answers there. You, you'd be surprised at the wisdom and the knowledge and, 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 and the greatness that our people have. Don't, we don't, don't be uh, confused oldness as being out of date. Don't confuse the idea of primitive as being less than what is new. European ideology and philosophy is regressive. It is backward and destructive. There is much more wisdom in our people and the history of our people than is current today in the European philosophy and ideology. But you have to ask the right questions. You have to go in with the questions in mind. Being separated from your history then is, uh, is, is, is a terrible situation to be in. And it has nothing to do with just forgetting your history. To be separated from your history is to be robbed of skills, to be, ro be robbed of, of coping techniques. I'm going to have to come back to you and talk to you about this because I'll have to deal with this concept of, of uh, social amnesia. <laughs> yeah, you got children. Yeah, yeah, amnesia. Amnesia has been deliberately inculcated in the minds of black people. Your children and our children having problems remembering their lessons is deliberately set in. You must forget many things in order to be servants to these other people. You must not have a long memory. The Jews in New York now are having a fit about Bishop Tutu being in Dinkins' camp in Dinkins' inauguration. Why? Because, because Bishop Tutu had nerve enough to tell them that they should forgive the Germans. And now they said, don't bring him in here. We don't want to be speaking so much. He doesn't know Jewish people. We don't forget like that. We, we're going to hold these Germans responsible for what they've done. And we're going to continue to hunt them down and punish them and deal with them for what they've done to our people. In fact, you Bible reading Negroes misread history altogether and misread the Bible so severely. If you really believed in that Old Testament, if you really read it correctly, you'd be tearing up this nation. <laughs> if you let somebody chip you into this business, that the Lord will take care of No way. No, sir. Reread that Old Testament again. All right? Reread Moses killing of 3,000 people and figure out why he had to kill 3,000 people at the bottom of that mountain. Do you remember that? No, because you know, in your little Sunday school, they just talk about the law, and they, they skipped over that part, right? <laughs> the Bible is a whole lesson in statecraft, a whole lesson in intelligence gathering, war, war, uh, you know, uh, war, and the whole, I mean, that's, this is why these people who are less than 3% of the U.S. population literally run this country because of that Old Testament, because the Old Testament teaches them all the kind of technology there is in the world, because you see it all there. Moses comes down, and, and why does he go up on the mountain? He goes up on the mountain because apparently these people are not even Jews in the truth, in the religious sense of the word yet. Otherwise, he wouldn't have any need to go up on the mountain to do what? Get the laws. Yeah, to get the laws and the rules. Apparently, they are in great disorder, aren't they? They are fighting among themselves. They're having terrific problems, but they've got to survive among their enemies. Moses then has got to go up on that mountain and come down with a unified system of values and orientation and to lay on these people because he knows they cannot survive among their enemies if they do not have this unity. And he goes up and brings the rules down. And then he sees them partying and living it up and carrying on, making gold cares and all the other stuff, worshiping the other people's gods. They're still worshiping Egyptian gods, by the way. The gold cares is an Egyptian god, right? And what does he tell them? All of you who believe and go with me, what? That's up here. And those of you, you who don't, what? Stand there. And then what does he do to those who stood there? out, slain on the spot. Why? Because we can't survive with division among ourselves. I'm in these places here, and you read and misread. You don't read the Bible, you read into the Bible. 
because people have already set your mind up in such a way that you can't see what's right in front of your eyes. Yes. How many of you read about the killing of the 24,000 Israelites for hanging out with Midianite women? Read, ladies and gentlemen. When did God desert these people? When they forgot who they were? When they forgot their identity? When they forgot their personal relationship with their God? Start worshiping the gods and values of other people? Start speaking the language of other people and getting hung up in other people and what happened? Every time they did it, what happened? Into bondage, into prison. They have learned that lesson well. You who call yourself children of Israel, has not learned the lesson well. And they don't forget it. You were willing for a cup of coffee and a hot dog sitting by a white person to forget all of the degradation that your ancestors went through at the end of my life. So you must have amnesia in order to live that way and feel comfortable with the murderers and killers of your people and people who still have it in their minds to enslave your children and use your children in the future. You, you gotta be, you gotta have a restricted mentality in order to be comfortable with that situation. That's why you're gonna see the restricted mentality in the classrooms and other places. This is, a, this is an economically safe place, ladies and gentlemen. It's all run together. It's all part and one of the same thing. You must forget your history. Because if you look back in that history, you will find Africans able to raise money using his African system that the Koreans still use today, that other groups still use today to take over your community. But because you have forgotten that system and you have forgotten your history, you've forgotten that means of raising money for getting control of your economic situation. Don't have time to read here an article here where Africans in the Cameroon, for instance, using the old African system, maybe some of you want to do a little research on it and get the New York Times, Monday, November 30th, 1987, of how these Africans are really, literally almost running the standard European system out of business by using an old African way of raising money, therefore not having to pay high interest and all the other kinds of things that we get into when we deal with Europeans. To the point where, as indicated here, one has to say, I have attended tons of teams that is African method raising money, where the monthly pot is one million dollars. These are poor people, but the whole people were able to come together. But you've forgotten those skills because you've forgotten your history. Your whole life and your present depends upon remembering what you learned in the past. If you forgot everything you learned in the past as an individual, you forget how to walk. You forget how to talk. You forget how to function. Your past is your present. History is never left back there. It's always right here. And every experience you have in the present is filtered through what you call history in your mind. But there's no such thing as history in the human mind. It is present. And you must bring back that present. We don't have time. We'll have to leave because we've got to catch a train. But I want to, in the future, come back now and deal with the kind of methods and so forth. I just want to leave you quickly with the idea of why economic development. You've been sold, you've been sold economics in terms of jobs. I want to impress on you again that if we don't have economic development, we're going to continue in economic dependency. And that means that we will continue to be vulnerable as a people. The Europeans are reorganizing, and that has ominous implications for us as African people. I have here a book, a magazine that talks about the Pacific Century. This is uh, Newsweek, February 22nd, 1988. And uh, if you get a little time, go pick it up. Human capital, uh, the decline of America's workforce, there was another here talking about America, America in decline. All of these have implications for us as, uh, as people. Our European ambassador, he was talking the other day, 
the gentleman that was talking to him said, well, now that Europe is reorganizing and so forth, will there be anybody in the United States concerned with Africa? The white ambassador says, I hope so. Hmm. The man asked him again. He says, I hope so. In other words, it's over in a sense. Because now you have other people, other nations, Eastern Europeans, will also be trying to get a piece of the economic pie to develop their own countries. So now money that used to be pretty much available to so-called quote third world countries and non-communist countries, these Europeans have become very smart, all of a sudden they become non-communist overnight. <laughs> and see, one thing I can say you can congratulate the European about, when they bump against the hard wall of reality, they don't mind switching up. <laughs> but it's the Negro that holds on, you know, And now these sudden non-capitalist people will be out here getting the European bucks and dollars that the Africans used to have a bit of access to. And the issue is now, where is that going to leave Africa as a nation? And where these Europeans are talking about locking the United States out of their market to a greater degree as possible. Well, you know what that means then for black people in the United States. We are going to be the first to suffer and suffer the most. Understand? These people do not intend to give this economic control to the Japanese. <laughs> they are now reorganizing themselves against the Japanese as a people. And I often ask the question, are we then to get from under the European heel only to fall under the Asian ones? And these uh, Asians, despite the fact that they are non-white, are not going to treat you any better than the yeah, white folk have treated you. Yeah. So you have to get off of this bag about, well, they're not white folk, you know, we have to. No, no, no way. You have to understand what is going on. You have to understand the relationship between economics and political influence. There is no real political influence without economic power. You have to understand that. The Krumah family understood that. He thought that by getting Africans elected in the heads of nations that Africans would really have power. He learned ultimately though that the Europeans still had the real power in African countries because they had the African economic system under their control. The election of black people to office is not power. It is ultimately the, the use and development of money and economics that represents power for us as people. Otherwise, the Jews who represent less than 3% of this population could not outweigh black people who represent about 15% of the same population. Your vote are not the ultimate statement of power. The ultimate statement of power is money, wealth, and economic control. You must understand that if you're not going to gain any respect for people through buying from them, how foolish you must look buying and feeding Koreans and everyone else while your own children must starve. You can spend as much money as you want to The ultimate thing, too, is about economics and science. You must understand economics is about life. The AIDS virus has been released on you. Other viruses are getting ready to be released on you. <coughs> The new kind of warfare will not be warfare with bombs, will not be warfare with laser weapons, but will be silent warfare where you'll be, you'll be killed in your bed. Hmm. You must understand that. Where the disease will just eat you up and eat your life, your crops will be diseased, your wealth will be changed and focused to the advantage of another people. You understand what I'm saying? That means that the new warfare has to be about in terms of intellect and economics. It means then that germ warfare is fought this way. You release the germ. The population upon whom the germ is released must have the intellectual talent and the institutions to develop vaccines and other medicines to defeat the germs. Or else they're going in. You understand? Which means then that if you do not have the universities, if you do not have the medical research institutions, if you do not have the hospital systems, if you do not have the distribution systems, you are going to die as a result of germ warfare. But it means, though, if you're going to have the institutions, you must have the economic system to support the institution. That's why you must ask yourself when you're teaching your children, knowledge for what? It is not enough even for children to be Afrocentric or even for children to have scientific knowledge and skills and that alone. 
they must also have institutions owned and run by their own people for their own purposes to work in, or else they will be apocentric and work for the enemy against themselves as people. Thank you very much.